when we did this uh, experimental uh, stuff with Dr. Workman and we stripped down one airplane, we weren't happy with the way it, it, we had to patch it up uh, or even a depot to patch it up. So we decided to order brand new airplanes. So Tibbetts put an order in for 25 new airplanes. They ran it through Boeing, the engineering department, and so forth, and they put a lot of new improve, a lot of improvements into the same. Uh, as long as they were doing it, they put in uh, Curtis Electric reversible propellers. Mm -hmm. They put in uh, engines that were better uh, constructed in terms of cooling. Uh, no carburetors. Uh, I think it was the first time. I don't know about the first time they used, but it was a direct inject fuel injection as opposed to a carburetor. So all those things we did to the new airplanes, they, the engineers wrote those things in, and, and they came out, and we got 25 new airplanes from the factory, and they were beautiful. We had dropped lots of what we call fat men in practice, 10,000 pounders, filled with concrete. Each crew dropped a couple on Japan with Torpex in the inside instead of nuclear stuff. Torpex is a, uh, is a very powerful uh, conventional uh, high explosive. And each airplane went to a, to a different target by itself. Now, uh, I'll never forget, Red Block went to a chemical company when they big, tremendous chemical company. And dropped a torque fix bomb, which was essentially the front man. And they dropped the top fix bomb and it went like smack on the nose. And it set off some sympathetic explosions down the line like this, one building after another. Well, you don't right. think you ever saw if you're in, at war. My crew was the only one that was on both missions. The sixth was the Russian. Uh, I flew the wing for Tibbetts. We had three uh, sets of instruments and uh, three scientists, certain scientists, with us. And we got no flak at Hiroshima. We had perfect weather, everything went perfectly. Just as if it was a walk in the park. Then we went up on the ninth with the weapon for the primary target of Kokura. I had a suspicion when Tippett assigned me to go as number two guy carrying the instruments, flying in formation with him uh, on Hiroshima. Uh, that night he came to me and he said to me, uh, uh, we're going to go on the ninth. He says, uh, the idea is to give the Japanese the one-two punch and make them think that we're we have more of these uh, coming along immediately. I knew what we only had to. But we wanted the Japanese to think that we had them coming, coming, coming. So he said, we're going to do it on the 9th, and we're going to do this. And the target's going to be Kokura, and we're going to use the same tactics. Um, that meant a rendezvous, and uh, uh, that meant uh, coming in at uh, high altitude. It meant a small formation of three airplanes, which was highly unusual and uh, therefore would write a signature perhaps for the Japanese on the second mission. We did get flak at Kokura. Uh, it started breaking left and right, especially to the left of our aircraft. We had, what, three weather airplanes. We were using our own immediate weather about one hour old. And we we had some visibility restrictions at Concora, and they were they were they were really pretty bad. We also had conflicting orders in a way that we had to drop visually. The scientists wanted to get the, a visual on what happened. So um, we're going into the target, uh, and we're getting some flak, and it's breaking a level off to the left and the right, and Ian, my bombardier, said, uh, 
I can't see the aiming point. Now, the aiming point was a big arsenal right on a river. We could have bombed by what we call offset bombing. We knew where the target was from, uh, from the contour of the river and various other things we call offset bombing. But we had the orders to drop visually. So when he said he couldn't see it, I took a look myself to make, confirm what he was seeing. He was, we didn't have him if he wouldn't have been the best. But uh, so uh, anyway, by that time we were beyond the target, we had to go back. So I changed my altitude to 31,000 feet to screw the uh, anti-aircraft guys in that fusing. I had been at 30, so now I now I climbed on my way back to the aiming point and uh, at 31,000 feet and came in, and we still got the flak, and it was getting a little heavier, but uh, uh, we went in and took another look, and, and uh, as I recall, we took four, uh, four, but it's 56 years now, and uh, they say we took three, but I think I took four, three from that same angle, and then I went out to see if the sun would have any effect on the visually, on the we could almost see the target, but not quite. It was hazy and smoky. Well, the smoke was what did us in, because the big city of Yawada had got a big fire bombing the night before, and that was like next door to Kokora, and uh, I wish they hadn't bombed them that night. But anyway, the wind had shifted since my weather airplane was there, and it was blowing that smoke as well as the haze and stuff. The haze was there. It was adding the smoke to uh, visibility, uh, lack of visibility. So I went back and came, and I'm still getting flack at 31,000 feet, so I went to 32,000 feet. Came in again, and uh, they uh, were still shooting flack. And, uh, but now we had a fuel problem. After the third run, I thought the fourth foot, let's say the third run, the flight engineer told me we were getting pretty low on fuel for what we needed to do, which was to go to Nagasaki. We always had a tertiary. The tertiary was near Ghana, but that was some kind of a joke because that was way up north and we were never going to make it anyway. I don't know. Some some army guy in the Pentagon picked that up. So we went to we went to Nagasaki. Now, um, the weather was uh, fairly good over there, except it was on, there were, so let's say, six to eight tenths, uh, cumulus at around eight to 10,000 feet, puffy summer clouds, but lots of them. And uh, they were fairly high for that type of cloud. They were obscuring angular visibility. So, uh, Ian, uh, said, I've got it, I've got it, when we were on the, on the run, no fighters, no, no flag. And, uh, Freddie Bach was right there. I was using his airplane, he was using mine. The reason for the change was that I had all of the instrument equipment, uh, read the, uh, data from Hiroshima. And rather than have the enlisted men go to all the trouble of changing it from one airplane to another, uh, I uh, decided to uh, just change airplanes. My crew on Fred Buck's airplane put Fred Buck's crew on my airplane. Freddie Buck was right on my wing all the way from, he was glued to me all the way from the rendezvous point. And he stayed right with me, you know, while I dropped. And, uh, he had Bill Lawrence of the New York Times with him, and he wrote a pretty good dispatch. A very good one, as a matter of fact. He was a very brilliant guy, science editor. All we did was work, 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 build the organization, train it, this and that. And uh, now we get over Hiroshima, and bingo, it works. Now, what did it do? I don't know. We don't know. We couldn't get any pictures, okay? So we assumed it worked because it went off at the right altitude and that sort of thing. So, uh, but we couldn't see anything. And uh, so I wasn't surprised. And uh, 
then I was a pretty busy guy on the ninth, and uh, I saw the flash. I had seen the flash of the rush, and I got the concussion, and I got the <coughs> flash, which was not new. So I wasn't, can't say that I was surprised.